Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to our second keynote lecture. My name is Tanya Herklotz and I work at the Chair for Public and Comparative Law with Professor Philip Dunn. And it is my great pleasure to introduce to you today today's keynote speaker, Justice Madan Lokur. Justice Lokur is a former judge of the Supreme Court of India who served in the Supreme Court from June 2012 until his retirement in 2018. Before being elevated to the Indian Supreme Court, Justice Madan Loko was a judge in the Delhi High Court and he served as a Chief Justice of the Delhi High Court, the Andhra Pradesh High Court and the Guwahati High Court. The Indian Supreme Court, as many of you will know, is famous in comparative constitutional law and law and development for its activist standpoint on questions particularly of social and economic rights. And in his long and illustrious career at the court, Justice Loko has played a significant role in putting the court's jurisprudence on constitutional law and law and development on the world's map. Justice Loko was part of several historic decisions of the Supreme Court that have been discussed internationally. These decisions include the National Judicial Appointment case, where the court struck down an amendment to the process of judicial appointments, which allowed for executive interference and compromised judicial independence. He was also part of the coal case in which the court struck down the allocation of coal blocks by the state for coal mining, and it evolved a standard for judicial review in cases of corruption. Further, he was part of a case where the court ordered the prosecution of those responsible for extrajudicial killings in the state of Manipur. And he was part of the independent thought case where the court held that the exception of marital rape, not being a crime in India's rape law, could not apply to minor wives. Significantly, and this is particularly interesting from a law and development angle, Justice Loko also headed the social justice bench of the Supreme Court. This is a bench dedicated specifically to hearing public interest litigation cases, meaning cases that are filed by individuals and organizations in the public interest to bring to light instances of legislative or executive inaction, often in response to social and economic rights. On the bench, Justice Loko dealt with issues relating to farmers and the right to food in states hit by drought the rights of children, especially in issues relating to social justice, the rights of women and senior citizens, and the protection of, in, of the environment. In these cases, he made an effort to engage in a conversation and dialogue with the legislature and the executive to understand how the judiciary can act as a catalyst in realizing people's social economic rights. Justice Lokwa's unique approach to the bench was seen as reasonable, reasonable yet highly effective in improving the situation of the people at large. And in fact, at the time of his retirement, in almost every mainstream Indian newspaper, there were numerous pieces written by lawyers appreciating Justice Lokwa's time on the Supreme Court, and I'm told that this is a rarity. Justice Loko also helped the cause of access to justice and judicial administration. He served as the head of the Supreme Court's e-committee that is responsible for the computerization of courts all over India as well as tracking judicial delays. Under his leadership, the committee set up a national data judicial grid which provides statistics on the cases pending in the high courts and the district courts all over India. And Justice Loko also ensured that the e-committee developed mobile applications for litigants to easily access information related to court services. He also chaired the Supreme Court Legal Services Committee, which offers free legal aid services to citizens, and he was a member of the Supreme Court's Juvenile Justice Committee. Subsequent to his retirement, Justice Loko continues to engage with issues related to access to justice and social rights in India, while also serving as a justice on the Supreme Court of Fiji. Justice Loko's keynote address, entitled Social Justice, a Vehicle for Transformative Constitutionalism, will address, will engage with uh, the experience of the Indian judiciary in enforcing social and economic rights. And please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Justice Loko.
Yeah, thank you, Tanya. That was quite a handful of an introduction, I must say. Um, and thank you, uh, Professor Philip Dan, for giving me this opportunity of being able to share some thoughts on uh, social justice litigation in India as being a vehicle for transformative constitutionalism. Uh, I have uh, uh, divided my uh, keynote into five sections. The first section is uh, a very brief uh, introduction, starting from the 1950s when our constitution uh, was enacted. The second section is uh, the beginning of social justice litigation. Certain events had happened in the 1980s, uh, which are of uh, great significance. The third section is, uh, deals with the relaxation of the locus standi principle, which I think gave a fillip to uh, social justice litigation as well as to public interest litigation. In the fourth section, I would like to discuss a few cases uh, that I had dealt with and uh, uh, the impact that they have had. And the final fifth section will be some of the lessons that have been learned from uh, this litigation that has been going on for quite some time now. So first, uh, the you know, very brief uh, introduction. Uh, we got our independence, uh, India got its independence in 1947. At that time, we had uh, the British rule for uh, more than 90 years, uh, directly under the Queen and the King of uh, England prior to that under the East India Company. And uh, we had something like 500 princely states uh, in different parts of uh, India. And they all had to come together to form one union of uh, India. Of course, there was a problem in the sense that uh, there was a partition of uh, the country and uh, Pakistan uh, ceded from uh, India. But at the time when the uh, constitution was being debated in the Constituent Assembly, the framers of the Constitution uh, were of the view that given the historical background of uh, colonial rule and so on, uh, we must give considerable importance to social justice. In fact, we must give considerable importance to justice as a concept. So the preamble to the Constitution of India recognizes justice, that is social justice, economic justice, and political justice. This was really the main theme of uh, uh, the uh, Constitution. And uh, soon after uh, independence, when the Supreme Court uh, came into existence in 1950, the uh, concept of social justice was given a somewhat narrow uh, meaning because of the history of uh, India being a colonial uh, state. And uh, social justice was given also a very narrow meaning and uh, because of uh, the development uh, imperatives, social justice was actually tied up with the rights of workers. So the first few judgments that you get in India in the 1950s and 1960s, which talk about uh, social justice, they deal with the rights of workers, uh, keeping in mind the industrialization of India. So this, like I said, was um, a very narrow sort of a concept. And uh, it took some time for uh, the Supreme Court to realize that uh, social justice is something far broader than only workers' rights. And then we come to the second uh, section, which is uh, sometime in the 1980s. There were two cases, two incidents that happened which were very, very disturbing. The first was uh, an incident pertaining to a protective home in uh, the city of Agra, which is famous for the Taj Mahal. Two professors of law from Delhi University had visited uh, the protective home, and they found that the condition of uh, the women who were staying over there, destitute women, was abominable in the sense that, uh, you know, there was no question of any hygiene, no sanitation, food was just about tolerable. Uh, the living conditions were horrible. Uh, and uh, Article 21 of the Constitution of India, which talks about the right to life, they felt was being violated in the sense that, of course, these uh, women were living, but they were not living like human beings. You know, they were not living the life of uh, a dignity. So they petitioned the Supreme Court and said that, you know, what is this going on in uh, this protective home? And the Supreme Court decided to take it up 
and uh, passed a series of directions, not only with regard to the protective home in Agra, but with regard to several protective homes in different parts of the country. And uh, during my research, I found that the case is actually still pending. You know, it started in the 1980s, early 1980s, 81, 82, and it is still pending. So it's an ongoing, uh, you know, sort of a uh, exercise that the Supreme Court has undertaken to ensure that uh, women in protective homes are given a life of dignity. That was one incident. The second incident was perhaps uh, even worse in the sense that uh, there were some persons who were accused of having committed crimes. And uh, the people in that area, uh, in, uh, in collusion with the police, actually pierced the eyes of these uh, accused persons with needles and with spokes from uh, the wheel of a cycle, and then put acid in the eyes. Uh, so this happened in a town called Bhagalpur, and uh, the case is known as the Bhagalpur Blindings case. Again, uh, the question of Article 21 came up that, uh, you know, first of all, justice must be given to these people. Secondly, can they live a life of dignity if they're being treated in this manner, where, you know, just because they happen to be accused of an offense, the police and the villagers over there, you know, start putting uh, acid into their eyes. So again, the Supreme Court took up this case. One of the blinded persons wanted to prosecute uh, the police, but the magistrate uh, gave a written order saying that there is no provision in the Code of Criminal Procedure to prosecute a person individually, a policeman individually. So this brought in the question of access to justice, which I will deal with um, a little later. So really, these two instances, you know, galvanized the Supreme Court into realizing that there is much more to life than just the law. And in both these cases, one of the things was taking note of the fact that something wrong was happening, something illegal, something unconstitutional, something violating the right to life was happening. But in addition to that, how about rehabilitating these people? So in the protective homes case, they set about passing directions so that the women could be rehabilitated. And like I said, the case is still pending uh, and uh, rehabilitation efforts are going on in different parts of the country. With regard to the Bhagalpur blindings, uh, the court gave a direction that they should be given medical assistance and the state will have to pay for the medical assistance. So this was really the broad outline of uh, the directions that was given um, by the Supreme Court. Now, some of the lessons that you know, we can gather from these two cases uh, is that positive human rights were being violated. Persons who are entitled to live a life of dignity were denied the life of uh, dignity through piercing their eyes with needles or not giving them uh, you know, sanitary uh, conditions, hygienic conditions to live in. So in that sense, positive human rights were being violated. Second is access to justice. How do these people get access to justice? It so happened that you know, two professors had gone to Agra, they had visited this home, but those destitute women may have been living there for months together, perhaps for years. How are they going to access justice? And when one of these victims of Bhagalpur blinding wanted to access justice, he was told by the magistrate that there is no provision in the uh, Code of Criminal Procedure to prosecute these persons for what they have done to you. So access to justice also had to be given a realistic meaning. And the Supreme Court appreciated that. And uh, this idea began to develop around the 1980s. The third thing that uh, came out of these two cases was that the Supreme Court realized that if it had to look at social justice in a positive manner, which the framers of the Constitution were looking at, then the Supreme Court had to have a proactive role. It could not just sit back and say, well, this is what the law is. We declared the law as being so-and-so, and beyond that, we have nothing to do. The Supreme Court realized that it has to be proactive. It has to do something so that the rehabilitation efforts can take place. And the underprivileged 
sections of society who perhaps have no access to justice, they are the ones who need the support of the Supreme Court for rehabilitation and for getting back into society. So these were you know, the beginnings of uh, social justice uh, litigation and the forward movement that was uh, adopted by the Supreme Court. A few years earlier, in 1979, there was an assault on the independence of the judiciary. The government had decided at that point of time that judges who delivered judgments which the government did not like, uh, well, the government had the power to transfer them. So they could be transferred from one high court to another high court uh, for a judgment which the government did not like. And uh, uh, large sections of lawyers, uh, including very senior lawyers, reputed lawyers, they came to the court and said, this is an assault on the independence of the judiciary. And they petitioned the Supreme Court and said that, uh, well, if this goes through, we will not have an independent judiciary in the country. One of the arguments that was raised, in fact, the principal argument that was raised by the government of India in that case was that you have been looking at social justice litigation on behalf of the underprivileged, destitute sections of society. These are lawyers who are privileged sections of society. They're doing very well, they're senior lawyers. They have no locus standi to come to the court. They're not arguing on behalf of uh, underprivileged persons or destitute persons. So therefore, their case should not be entertained. So this objection having been taken, the Supreme Court had, of course, to deal with it. And in dealing with that, the Supreme Court said that when we are talking about social justice litigation, when we are talking about public interest litigation, it cannot be narrowed down only to those who are underprivileged or those who are destitute or those who are in the margins of society. We are doing it for society. And the society includes persons who may be in a position of privilege. So why can we not entertain a petition that has been filed by persons who are in a privileged position on behalf of persons who are destitute or underprivileged. And in this particular case, where there's an assault on the independence of the judiciary, which is going to affect the entire country. So the argument given by the government of India uh, of uh, locus standi was rejected. Now this, uh, in my view, had you know, a very major impact on uh, social justice uh, litigation and on uh, socioeconomic litigation. We had two cases coming up soon after that. One related to bonded labor. Now, bonded labor is when a person is unable to pay his debts for whatever reason. I mean, obviously a poor person who has borrowed money from a money lender, unable to pay the debts because uh, of some calamity in the family. It could be because of uh, you know, failure of the crops. It could be for a variety of reasons, sickness and so on and so forth. So the money lender says that somebody wants, uh, you know, uh, uh, wants you to work for him. So how about working for him? So this person has to go and work for that person. His family has to go and work for that person because they have to get out of that debt. And there were instances of a couple of generations being a part of bonded labor. This was before independence. It continued after independence in 1947. And Article 23 of the Constitution of India prohibited bonded labor. They said that they cannot be bonded labor, they cannot be untouchability, and this is abolished. A law was passed by Parliament abolishing bonded labor. But notwithstanding this, bonded labor continued. So an NGO, uh, filed a petition. This was among the first few petitions filed by any NGO in the country. An NGO filed a petition saying that, you know, bonded labor is uh, going on right under your nose in a district pretty close to Delhi where the Supreme Court is located. How about doing something about it? So the Supreme Court took up that matter. Again, it overruled uh, the objection about uh, locus standi. It uh, looked into the matter and uh, said that the Constitution has declared that there cannot be any bonded labor. So all the bonded labor over here are hereby declared as free. 
So the impact of this, some say that something like 30,000 uh, bonded laborers were freed, some say 50,000 were freed. But the reality is that of course they were freed, but they were still very poor. And they had to come back to those very same people and you know, start working for them all over again in conditions which were even worse. So really, this intervention by the Supreme Court to an extent helped some of the bonded labor, but did not help some others, put them perhaps in a worse uh, position. But anyway, the, the point was established that social justice litigation is here to stay, and we are now in the Supreme Court going to look after the rights of the underprivileged. The second case was also by an NGO, which related to environmental pollution. So there was this limestone mining that was going on in a very haphazard manner, and uh, with the result that uh, limestone dust was polluting a city. And this NGO, which was more concerned with the environment, said that the right to life is being destroyed. We are not able to breathe fresh air. And since the Supreme Court has been saying that the right to life involves the right to uh, life of dignity, how about doing something about the environment? So the Supreme Court took up this uh, case and passed a series of directions, and eventually the mining had to be stopped uh, in that area. So you had this conflict of development on the one hand. The miners said that we were doing it for a good cause, and you had the uh, problem of pollution and social justice and human rights of the people who were suffering as a result of this uh, pollution. Now, <clears throat> This, these two cases, and there were a couple of other minor cases, they laid down the view that uh, public interest litigation, social justice, and human rights are intrinsically linked. And while you may talk about development, you have to talk about development keeping social justice in mind. You have to talk about development keeping human rights in mind. You can't say that for the sake of development, you know, forget about human rights or forget about uh, social justice. The Supreme Court also laid down the view that um, because of these two cases and because of the earlier case about the assault on the independence of the judiciary, that the underprivileged and the destitute could approach the courts through persons who were privileged enough to be able to access the courts. It was not necessary for somebody you know, who is uh, destitute to somehow or the other come to the Supreme Court probably for financial reasons that person would not have been able to come to the Supreme Court. So therefore their cause could be taken up by persons who were more affluent or well-to-do in society. The Supreme Court also made a very important change. These petitions that were entertained of bonded labor and of the environment were based on letters that were written to the Supreme Court. They were not petitions in the formal sense. There were letters that had been filed or brought to the notice of the Supreme Court by these interested persons. And the Supreme Court said that these kind of technicalities of you know, filing a petition in a particular format and so on and so forth will not apply to public interest litigation, will not apply to social justice litigation. So really these technicalities were given up by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court also, in the process of uh, looking at rehabilitation and so on, was looking at something called the continuing mandamus, a follow-up of the directions. We have issued directions. Are you looking at them? Are you implementing them? These were the beginnings of uh, continuing mandamus. Of course, it took another 20 years for uh, continuing mandamus to get recognized and become a part of the uh, jurisprudence of um, uh, the Supreme Court. Now, from the 1980s onwards, say about from the mid-1980s or late 1980s uh, till about uh, maybe 2010, 2012, there was a huge gap. You know, social justice litigation just went into the background. Public interest litigation picked up. And public interest litigation then went into diverse areas because anybody could approach the court. So environment became a big issue. People filed petitions for protection of the environment. Uh, people filed uh, petitions for um, uh, the forests, preserving the forests, on issues of governance, on issues of corruption, 
widespread corruption in a particular area. Can the Supreme Court do something about it? The police is not acting. The anti-corruption branch is not acting. Can you give directions to them to um, you know, prosecute these persons who are involved in corruption? Electoral reforms. That was, again, a very big issue in the earlier part of this uh, century. So there was this huge gap. And uh, social justice litigation actually went, receded into the background. And it was taken over by some of these other uh, areas. Right to information, that also became a very big uh, issue in the country. Sometime in 2015, uh, the Chief Justice of India uh, and I uh, had a discussion. And uh, I was of the view at that point of time that uh, you know social justice litigation has receded into the background. And uh, there is still so much that needs to be done for the destitute and the poor. Uh, and well, on our part as the Supreme Court, I think we should do something about it. And the Chief Justice uh, asked me you know, what could be done. And I suggested that we could have something called a social justice bench, which would deal only with these kind of cases. The Chief Justice agreed, and he requested me to preside over that bench and look at social justice issues vis-a-vis -vis development and see what can be done about it. So in 2015, the social justice bench uh, was uh, set up by the Chief Justice. And there were so many cases that were pending. You know, For years together, they were pending, not being taken up. And uh, they had a very large number of issues uh, that were being raised. So one of the problems that was being faced was that how do you identify all the issues? If there are 20 or 30 cases pending, you have to go through each one of those, identify the issues, find out what is the progress, what are the directions given by the Supreme Court. Have those directions been complied with? If not, why not? What can be done to ensure compliance? Is it that the bureaucracy is being lethargic? Is it that the bureaucracy is not interested? What is the reason? So implementation of these directions, which had been issued from time to time, you know, were not being looked into as they should have been in a continuing mandamus jurisdiction. So these were some of the uh, problems uh, you know, that were being faced by the social justice bench in the initial year or so, how to implement the socioeconomic rights of the underprivileged and those who are in the margins of society. Now, I would like to deal with uh, uh, you know, a few cases uh, that we had uh, uh, before us, which raised some of these issues. One of them is uh, a case called Sampurna Behura. She was a journalist. She is a journalist. And uh, her concern was that of uh, the rights of uh, the child. 40% of the population of India below the age of uh, 18 years, which is, I think, more than the population of many countries, something like 500 million children we have below the age of 18 years. They were not being given their due under the Convention of the Rights of the Child. We had a Juvenile Justice Act. That was not being implemented. So she had come up to the court way back in 2006. The case came up before me in 2015, 2016. And she said that you know, something has to be done for the rights of the child. We took up this case and we found that there was a complete mess. Institutions that were required to be set up had not been set up. Homes that were required to be set up had not been set up. If they were set up and established, the conditions were appalling. The toilets in some places did not have any doors. In some places, there was no electricity. In some places, there was no water. Food was a problem. Discipline was a problem. The children had nothing to do. So all kinds of problems had arisen. And uh, we had to take up this case and uh, pass a series of uh, directions. And uh, the government, of course, uh, uh, was a little hesitant initially. But then they realized the importance of uh, looking after the children of the country and then began to cooperate uh, slowly, but they did cooperate. On the jurisprudential aspect, uh, one of the important developments in this case was that of the introduction of the concept of restorative justice. 
That is something that had not been discussed earlier. But because children were involved, because uh, they had to be restored back to society, uh, the Supreme Court introduced the concept of uh, restorative justice. The second case related to uh, reforms in prisons. Now, a former Chief Justice of India, he wrote a letter to the Supreme Court saying that the conditions in prisons are appalling. They're overcrowded to the extent of 300%. So if you have a prison, say for 1,000 people, there would be 3,000 people over there. There would be violence in the prisons. People would commit suicide. All kinds of illegal uh, activities were going on in some of them. And uh, he said that, you know, you are supposed to look after the rights, the fundamental rights of people. Article 21, right to live with dignity. How about prisoners? They're also citizens of India. They're also human beings. How about looking after their interests? So this letter petition sent by the former Chief Justice of India was taken up. And uh, a series of directions were issued to somehow or the other reduce uh, overcrowding. I have not been very successful in that, but uh, some steps have been taken. But again, the positive developments are that the government of India was directed to have some kind of a model prison manual, which they did, that is in circulation in the country. The concept of open prisons uh, was floated so that people don't have to be in a jail, uh, so to speak, and they could be in open prison. A committee was set up, which is still functioning, to look into the laws with regard to prisons and how to better manage uh, prisons uh, administratively and from the human rights perspective. The third case is that of uh, Swaraj Abhiyan, uh, <clears throat> which again is an NGO, and they raise some very, very important issues about the right to work, the right to employment, and the right to food. One of the problems here was that we have this uh, scheme for uh, rural employment where the person goes and works. There's a guarantee that you will get 100 days of employment in a year if you're unemployed. But the wages were not being paid or they were being paid after some delay. Swaraj Abhiyan brought this to the notice of the court and said that, well, it's a wonderful scheme. You know, it's providing employment to so many people, but they're not being paid their wages in time. The government, of course, reacted by saying, we don't have the money. So the answer of the court was, we asked them, well, if you don't have this money, then why are you having this welfare scheme? You know, might as well abolish the scheme, which obviously they could not. So they somehow or the other managed to get the money. They did have the money, but were reluctant to part with it. Um, but eventually, uh, I think the budget got more or less doubled uh, during the period uh, that we were hearing the case. The right to food was a huge campaign, which was uh, canvassed also by Swaraj Abhiyan. Again, institutions not set up. The food commissions were not being set up. Nutritional values were not determined. How much food is to be given to persons on a subsidized basis, not being decided. So we had to tell the government that, you know, how about setting up these institutions? The law says, that you must have a food commission. Why are you not setting up a food commission? We told the government that have a social audit. This was again a contribution made by the social justice bench. You have social audits. Find out what is wrong, where is it wrong, and how can you rectify it? This was again done through you know, a process of uh, continuing mandamus for the purpose of that welfare scheme, for employment to get the money out of the government, for the purposes of food, to get them to set up these institutions. Building and other construction workers was another scandalous uh, case, so to say. Uh, very poor people were involved in uh, building houses, infrastructure, multi-story buildings, and so on. In a sense, they were being exploited. The law said that anybody who is carrying on a construction of a particular size will have to pay a cess to the government. The official figures, the official figures indicated that something like 300 million US dollars had been collected over the years, but not passed on to these workers. Those are the official figures. 
in my estimate, probably the unofficial figures would be double that amount, maybe much more, if you take corruption of the authorities into account. Migrant labor was the worst hit. They're too poor to afford a house. So they have to go from place to place to look for you know, some job in some construction site. They were not even known to the government. We tried to tell the government to uh, do something about it. They came out with a system of identity cards not implemented. The problem was so huge that even now, you know, the government is unable to tackle that problem. And we are talking about huge amounts of money. Child brides, uh, which is something that uh, Tanya had uh, mentioned about. <clears throat> we have this uh, in some parts of the country. Uh, children getting married. And uh, an NGO came up to the court and said, well, a child bride, if she has sexual intercourse with her husband, it amounts to rape. The Indian Penal Court said that if you have sexual intercourse with your wife, who is above the age of uh, 15, well, it's not rape. Now, this was challenged by an organization called Independent Thought. The argument was that you have a law called the Juvenile Justice Act, which is supposed to protect children. You have the International the Convention on the Rights of the Child. You have a law on uh, prevention of uh, prohibition of uh, child sexual abuse. That's an offense. If you look at the entire legal structure, you will realize that if a husband has sexual intercourse with his wife, who is above the age of 15, it would amount to rape. We got very good assistance, uh, I must say, from the lawyers in this case. We looked at the Indian Penal Code. We looked at uh, the various laws. We looked at the issue of child brides. It's, uh, well, South Asia has the maximum number of child brides. And in South Asia, India has the maximum number of uh, child brides. And we looked into this problem, and we concluded that uh, it would amount to rape. Fortunately, the government has uh, accepted that decision and is implementing it to a very, very large extent. Uh, the uh, magistrates, the bureaucrats, they're all pretty active. You know, whenever they get information about uh, a child marriage, they go and intervene. There is one particular day in a year which is supposed to be auspicious, you know, for child marriages. So the bureaucracy is really geared up for that one particular day to ensure that child marriages do not take place, and it has been very successful. Another case that we had to deal with was that of uh, extrajudicial killings in the state of uh, Manipur. 1,528 people were alleged to have been killed on the ground that they were insurgents. This was over a period of time. It didn't happen in a day or so. It happened over a period of time. The defense of the paramilitary forces was that these people are insurgents, they attacked us, and we fired in self-defense. And we had no option but to you know, kill them, otherwise we would have got killed. We sent some test cases to uh, a former judge of the Supreme Court to find out uh, you know, what, what is the exact position. One of the cases dealt with a child of 12 years of age who had been shot in the back. So we asked the government that how could a child of 12 years be an insurgent, number one? Number two, how could he be firing at you? I mean, he was trying to run away. He got shot in the back. You know, so th there's obviously something strange in your uh, argument. So taking up cases of this kind, we directed the Central Bureau of Investigation to look into these cases and to find out whether, in fact, there was a genuine encounter, whether these persons were genuinely insurgents or whether you know, the uh, paramilitary forces were just trigger happy and uh, anybody who was suspicious you know, just uh, knocked them off. So it's a long exercise. There is a huge amount of resistance from the government because of the paramilitary forces being involved. But gradually, the investigations have progressed and uh, cases have been filed for murder against uh, some of these people, quite a few. On, uh, when I was on the bench, something like 34 cases had been filed, uh, accusing some of them of murder. So, you know, you have a very large 
range of these kind of cases, we dealt with uh, widows who go from one part of the country to a town called Vrindavan, uh, the birthplace, uh, well, not the birthplace, but very close to the birthplace of Lord Krishna. Uh, you know, they are driven out of their homes because of some belief that the person has become a widow because she was responsible for the death of her husband. So she is thrown out of the house and she has to go and settle down in Vrindavan. Again, no dignity attached to these uh, women. Living in horrible conditions, you know, no food, virtually begging, uh, you know, in a temple, trying somehow or the other to get food. We've had issues with the LGBT community. A judgment was passed some time back. Transgenders, reproductive rights of uh, women. Many of the women were forced into, uh, into sterilization. They didn't even know what was happening. They were told that we'll give you some money and there'll be some kind of a surgical procedure. A couple of days later, they find out that they've been sterilized. So uh, children in orphanages, we had to deal with acid attacks where, well, a girl doesn't get along with her boyfriend and the boyfriend in revenge throws acid on her face, you know, completely disfigures her. And plastic surgery and all that is remarkably expensive. So we've had, you know, a variety of cases dealing with a variety of sections of society. It's not only the underprivileged, the destitute, women, children, persons coming from privileged families. Many of these acid attacks uh, you know, were on girls who come from uh, respectable families. Many of the extrajudicial killings were of uh, children who came from, of persons who came from uh, respectable families. So really the social justice canvas you know, kind of expanded from 2015 onwards. Now, what are the lessons uh, you know, that we have learned through this entire exercise. One is that uh, <clears throat> violation of human rights can take place in a positive manner. Extrajudicial killings in human conditions in prisons, those have to be checked. It could be done in a negative manner where the government says, well, you know, we are not going to act. The law says set up an institution, we are not going to set up the institution. The law says set up some authority, we're not going to set up that authority. So non-implementation of the laws, non-implementation of the welfare schemes, or poor implementation of uh, welfare schemes in a negative manner. All this impacts, by the way, on development, because the welfare schemes are for the development of society. So there is this apathy, you know, which is in, the, in, a, in a negative uh, form. On the point of uh, jurisprudence, we have uh, the social justice bench has been able to introduce uh, concepts of uh, restorative justice, social audits, um, changes being brought about in uh, society through uh, you know, penalizing uh, child sexual abuse, widows, improvement in the conditions of uh, widows, continuing mandamus where there's a follow-up, a direction is given, are you implementing that direction? If not, why not? How are you implementing it? Reforms in prisons, where even prisoners are treated as uh, you know, human beings. Case management techniques had to be introduced. Uh, implementation strategies. Committees had to be formed, particularly in environmental uh, litigation. Judges are not experts, so you need to get expert opinion from uh, persons who are dealing with the environment. Collaboration with the government functionaries, as uh, Tanya had mentioned. The government, the bureaucrats have to be told that, listen, you're doing this for the good of the people. It's not that, you know, for political reasons, uh, something has been announced or parliament has enacted a law, but you're doing it for the benefit of the people. So please cooperate, please look into the matter. And I must say that in a very large number of cases, perhaps in all of them, you know, we got very good assistance from the uh, bureaucrats. They said that, yes, there is a problem, and we will look into it. And particularly in the case of widows in uh, Vrindavan, it has been very, very successful. There have been, of course, been setbacks, like in the extrajudicial killings, 
Uh, but yes, that's, I suppose that's part of the game. Uh, <clears throat> social welfare legislation tied up with uh, development has to be given a very, very broad meaning for the benefit of the people. Um, I think this has been generally accepted by the Supreme Court and by the um, Government of India. Human rights, dignity, they're all a part of social justice and development. We've had, like I said, dealt with prisons, children, victims of crime, killings, exploitation. These are all the depressed sections of society which need to be uh, you know, brought up. Access to justice has become a reality. Gone are the days of Bhagalpur blindings when uh, the magistrate said that there is no law available. Anybody can now approach the court on a social justice cause and get directions from the court. The executive was told, the legislature was told that if you don't enact a law or if you don't implement a law, the judiciary is not going to sit back. It's going to be proactive. And it's going to ensure that the law is implemented. It is going to ensure that the depressed sections of society are very well looked after. Finally, uh, I believe that uh, the law can be used, the courts can be used, and the law can be used, the existing law can be used for the benefit of the people under the umbrella of Article 21 of the Constitution, which is the right to life. We have given the right to life a very, very broad meaning. Commonly, it is said that life does not mean animal existence. It's much more than animal existence. And I think the Supreme Court has realized that. The government has also, I think, realized that. So through this process, you know, social justice, which was the aim of the um, framers of the Constitution, and development uh, have been tied up. And uh, well, I think we are marching forward. Hopefully, things will change in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for those uh, uh, reflections, uh, Justice Lakur. Uh, I've heard you speak a few times, and each time uh, I, I, I take away something different. Uh, my name is Mario Gomez. I'm, I'm with a think tank uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, I have two questions for you. Uh, yesterday, the question of legal transplants came up briefly in the plenary. Uh, and in a context in which uh, public interest litigation and strategic litigation has grown worldwide, uh, in a context in which constitutional litigation is now being used for economic and social rights, uh, what impact do you think the Indian experience with social uh, justice litigation with PIL uh, has had in different, different parts of the world? Uh, my second question relates to uh, difficult political contexts. Uh, when the political regime in power perhaps uh, doesn't welcome some of these judgments, or you have an illiberal regime or an oppressive regime, uh, given your experience with the courts for so many years, uh, what are your reflections in terms of the courts trying to navigate uh, the tensions that might arise uh, when you sometimes face challenging political regimes? Uh, hi, thank you. Uh, I'm from Brazil, and my question is kind of related to the second question. So, um, okay, I think courts have uh, an important role, but what, what if uh, courts are progressive and the people like the political culture and the civil society is not? And if they are conservative and the courts like can lead to changes, but if the culture is not like leading to this direction, what happens? Like, how can we deal with this situation? Not, not only in the government, I mean, the government can be a dictatorship, can be something conservative, but the people, like, I mean. Maybe we can have one a third question and then um, have time to answer. Uh, my question is very specific uh, about the recent amendment, amendments in the Right to Information Act and how that would whittle down the social justice uh, and public interest litigation culture in the country. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> well, you know, uh, so far as your first question is concerned about uh, the impact uh, that this kind of litigation 
um, could have or has had uh, in the region. Uh, I know as a matter of fact that uh, public interest litigation over the years uh, has been accepted in uh, Nepal. It has been accepted in uh, Bangladesh quite some time back. It has been accepted in Pakistan uh, also and uh, perhaps also in Sri Lanka. I'm not very sure about Sri Lanka. But certainly in this region it has had an impact. And um, even in some of the uh, you know, other countries, people are looking at the idea you know, of um, public interest litigation, may not be in, in, in the phrase public interest litigation, but in the concept where something can be done for the people through uh, approaching the courts. It could be by an NGO, it could be you know, molding the law or reinterpreting the law in such a manner that uh, you, know, you have access to justice. So I think it has had an impact uh, in the uh, region around India. And uh, I, I don't think there's, it's, it's, uh, there's no question of going back on this at all. The second uh, part of your question about uh, uh, you know, if, the, if, the, if the government is not cooperative, well, um, one of the strategies that uh, we had adopted and which I had mentioned was to uh, get the government officers, the bureaucrats involved in the decision-making process. So if we felt that there was a problem and the government was not uh, you know, reacting in a positive manner, for example, shortage of funds, so we called the bureaucrat to the court and said that, you know, what is the problem? And uh, then she told us, you know, what the problem was and we had a discussion with her and uh, somehow the other, uh, you know, uh, got over the problem. The problem in this particular case of uh, rural employment was that the Ministry of Finance was not releasing the money. You know, they had the money, but they were not releasing it. So she was able to take it up with the Ministry of Finance. But this collaboration, uh, you know, or cooperation and discussion with the bureaucrats, uh, with the officers of the government, I think made a huge difference in implementing the orders of the court because they also realized that, you know, it's not that the court is just asking them to do something just for the heck of it. You know, it, it is, we are asking them to do it because it's a part of the constitution, it's a part of the law. And uh, <clears throat> with regard to, you know, society not accepting uh, some of these changes, uh, yeah, there, there are issues, you know. Um, we've had this problem with the LGBT community, for example. Um, the Supreme Court has decriminalized uh, homosexuality amongst consenting adults. But there are large sections of society which are not accepting the judgment. Uh, we've had a case about uh, the entry of women into a temple at a time when they are menstruating. The Supreme Court said that, you know, just because a woman is menstruating at a particular point of time, it does not mean that she cannot enter a temple. Again, there's been a lot of resistance to that from some sections of society. But yes, you know, uh, that is the law. And if the law has to be followed, uh, either the government accepts it or, and society accepts it, or uh, they have to change the law. You know, there, there, there is no, I can't see any third alternative. And um, protests, of course, do take place, you know, but the experience has been that after a time, it just dies down. So the resistance to LGBT community, the resistance to entry of, uh, you know, some women into uh, temples, there was resistance, but it is now, you know, kind of petering out. Uh, with regard to your question, uh, Prithush, about uh, the Right to Information Act, yes, there is a dilution. Uh, how it is going to have an impact is very difficult to say. Um, there was talk of uh, some of the right to information activists going to the court to say that, you know, you've made the law completely meaningless. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen to that. Uh, but I must tell you about a development that has taken place maybe just about two weeks ago in the state of Rajasthan. Uh, which is in the uh, western part of India. That's where the right to information movement began. The government has digitized a whole lot of information. 
and they have now put it up on the internet. So actually, I can find out, you know, uh, if I have to go to a Russian shop, I can find out how much wheat does he have, how much rice does he have, how much cooking oil does he have, all right? And I can find out on a day-to-day -day basis and also find out, you know, where that uh, oil has gone or where that rice has gone. Um, we've had, uh, you know, a very poor monsoon uh, prior to this and uh, subsidies were given to farmers. Has the subsidy been given or has it not been given? Has the compensation been given? Has it not been given? If so, how much has been given? I have a Russian card. I'm entitled to use that Russian card in a Russian shop, but I don't go there because I can afford to buy it in the open market. So through that internet, uh, through that website, they can identify me and say that, listen, you have a Russian card. You've not utilized it for the last six months. How about surrendering it? You know, and then I will say, yeah, I have not utilized it, so I will surrender it. So now, if this website in the state of Rajasthan gets picked up, and I've written about it, and I have said that it should be picked up, then RTI will become redundant, because all the information will be available on the internet. But yeah, there, there is going to be a challenge to this. Um. The lady in the back and then the gentleman in the front. Awesome. Hello, thank you. Lavenda here from the Danish Refugee Council in Uganda. I picked up some of your closing remarks. My question is, how can the judiciary be proactive? Um, because you said that in India, the judiciary did inform the legislature that it would be proactive and not sit back and wait for laws to be formed. I just want to hear some of the, the actual things that the judiciary is doing, and that will inform uh, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you. Maybe we first take the other question over there, yes. Hello, thank you. My name is Siobhan Airy and I'm from Ireland. And the reason I'm mentioning that I'm from Ireland is because there's a lovely historical connection between uh, how the Constitution of India and the Constitution of Ireland actually evolved at the same time as two countries coming into a newly independent statehood and sovereignty and embracing all the, I suppose, the vision of justice that that could potentially, you know, make manifest for the people living in the country. And I guess I'm just wondering, um, just thank you so much for your reflections, first of all, in your presentation. Um, Ireland has directive principles of social policy, Article 57. Um, they've never been legislated on. They've never been, um, there's been no decision ever made at the High Court or Supreme Court on it. And so for, for legal, um, kind of critical legal people like myself, we're incredibly frustrated with that. And especially so in the instance of the most recent austerity measures that were um, imposed on Ireland by the Troika you know, post the financial crisis. And it prompted um, a debate in Ireland about how effective can constitutions and national level legislative spaces, be they be the legislature or at the court uh, side, be in the face of international uh, regimes that impose, for example, in the Irish case, austerity. But I'm also thinking of other countries, for example, South Sudan in its new constitution has principles that relate very explicitly to development and justice, arguably, in there. But we are now living in a different era where we have multiple regimes interfacing with the national uh, uh, judiciary, legislature and, and, and law. And I just wonder if you have any reflections on this about these perhaps new challenges uh, for constitutional law, constitutional lawyers and indeed justices in that space. Thank you. And then there's the last question here in the front. Uh, thank you for your presentation. My name is Smith Omar from Cardiff University. You've called for the expansion of uh, uh, the broadening of the meaning to social justice. Uh, but in certain cases, this broadening may be in conflict with other protected rights, like uh, the right to property. So how do you balance between a case where, for instance, individuals are calling for the uh, 
protection of their right to housing uh, and, and yet probably they're squatting on private land. How do you balance between those kinds of interests? Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, you know, uh, with regard to your question about uh, the courts being proactive, um, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, like I said, the laws in India, many of the laws in India, right to food security, for example, says, or the right to, uh, you know, the Juvenile Justice Act uh, with regard to children, it says that you have to set up a body to look into the issues of children. So under the Juvenile Justice Act, you have something called the National Commission for the Protection of Child Rights. Now, the, uh, the chairperson had not been appointed for 18 months. You know, so the body was a headless body for 18 months. When we asked questions that why are you not appointing a chairperson, the government had to come out with an answer. And the result of that was that they speeded up the process, which, I mean, not speeded up, they hadn't even started the process, they decided to start the process and uh, appoint the chairperson. You have, uh, you know, like uh, the uh, uh, widows of uh, Vrindavan uh, that I had mentioned. Now, if you look at life in that larger context of a life of dignity, a life not of animal existence, nutrition, you know, so on and so forth. You have a constitutional basis for all this. And all that the court is saying is that your constitution, our constitution, says that this must be done. Why is it not being done? There has to be a reason for it. And unless you give a good reason, you have to implement the law of the land, you have to implement the constitutional provisions. Now, in one case, they said, we don't have money. Where is the money going? Then why do you have a scheme like this? You know, I mean, are you just doing it for political reasons, that we're going to have a scheme so that, you know, people are happy, but, uh, you know, let the scheme lapse? That, we had said, we are not going to accept. So if you do something, do it properly, or just say that, listen, you know, we made a mistake and we withdraw the schemes. The government cannot with all the schemes, uh, you know, which are meant for the benefit of uh, the people. So it is in that context, you know, where the court is pushing the government to do what it should be doing as required by the constitution, as required by the law made by parliament, and as required by schemes that have been formulated by the government. That you are the ones who have done this. You are the ones who have taken this step. Now, take it to its logical conclusion. That is, you know, uh, the sense in which uh, I meant proactive. Um, with regard to Ireland, you know, um, uh, you said that uh, the directive principles uh, were more or less simultaneous with the, the directive principles in India, but actually we borrowed it from Ireland. Uh, one of the framers of our constitution had gone to Ireland and he found this to be a wonderful idea. So the idea was borrowed and put into our constitution. It is not justiciable. But uh, <clears throat> the principles that have been laid down in the directive principles are being implemented in some form or the other. You know, for example, one of the uh, directive principles is that there will be equal pay for equal work, right? Now that becomes a part of equality, the right to equality. So although the directive principle of equal pay for equal work is not being directly implemented, it is being implemented through the right to equality. Then equal wages for men and women, again, as a part of equality. So really there is this interlinking between the directive principles, which are not justiciable, and the fundamental rights which are justiciable. So when you talk about, you know, better nutrition for children, that's one of the directive principles of uh, uh, state policy. Uh, better nutrition for women, better nutrition for children. It comes within the right to life. 
that are you going to deny good nutrition to women and children, particularly pregnant women or lactating women? Are you going to deny to them just because it is not justiciable? You can't do that. S many of these socio-economic rights are part of the directive principles of state policy, but which have been incorporated into legislation. So that is what is being enforced. It is the law that is being enforced. It is the fundamental rights which are being enforced. That is the linkage between the directive principles and the fundamental rights. Uh, with regard to uh, your question about uh, you know, social justice being given a broad meaning and perhaps infringing on some other rights, uh, well, frankly, I have not come across uh, any such case uh, in the last couple of years that I've been dealing with this. But again, housing is something that you had mentioned. So the government has a scheme you know, for uh, urban housing. They say that we're going to provide housing for all over a period of time, and we're going to set up this committee, and that committee is going to ensure that there's going to be housing for all. That issue, by the way, came up in the court. And we asked the government that you, it's a scheme that you have formulated. You know, it's, it's not a, a formulation by the court. It's a formulation by the government. What are you doing about it? And as luck would have it, the, uh, the committee that was set up had met only once. You know, and perhaps they had tea and biscuits and went off. So we asked questions. You know, what are you doing about it? How, how, how do you plan to do it? On the one hand, for employment, you say you have no money. How are you going to construct houses? You say that, you know, the cities in uh, India are overcrowded. Where are you going to get the land from? So are you going to look at this scheme, welfare scheme that you have promulgated? Are you going to look at it in a positive manner or not? So the government has to give an answer. And to some extent, you know, they have been able to provide in some places, not, not in the bigger cities, but in some cases they've been able to provide uh, housing for the poor. That's also tied up with the you know, proactive uh, uh, work of the Supreme Court. Where you have this continuing mandamus, where you say that, listen, you are supposed to do this. You said you will do it. Are you doing it? If you're not doing it, why are you not doing it? You know, we, we would like to have an answer. And that was, in a sense, pushing the government to doing things. More questions? Um, I'll go to this side of the room for now. Uh, the, the, the lady and then the gentleman in the front. Mr. Justice, thank you for your keynote. I'm Andrea. I'm an associate professor of law in Brazil. And part of my research has been developed on the human right to water. And Indian judges have been very active in the affirmation of this right. Sometimes they, they have affirmed it as a human right to health. Sometimes as a human right to housing, to a healthy environment. Has it evolved in India to a human right to water, an autonomous one? And that's my question to you. Thank you. To water, yeah. Uh, thank you. More of a general question. My name is Adrian. I'm from Canada. I work with the International Development Research Center. You focused a lot on the, the challenges of implementation of judgments, and you've come back to continuing mandamus, some of the pushing of the courts. And first to say it's very inspiring to hear you speak because so many of these judgments in India, we take them as models on social economic rights and other countries around the world. And I guess my question would be, if you take off your lawyer's hat, your legal hat, your judicial hat, what are some things that you would think would be helpful or you would look for as a court to come from outside to help reinforce your efforts to ensure implementation? Because it's very nice to hear and inspiring to hear that the human rights and the development sides go together. And you've spoken about the human rights side. What are some of the things that would complement in addressing the development questions that are still there, whether or not we frame it legally or not? Thank you. And there's another question here. 
Hello, uh, I'm Malabika from India. My question to you is that uh, since independence, Indian economy has witnessed uh, enormous land acquisition and as a result of it, almost more than 100 million people have been displaced. So has this displacement issue uh, come uh, before the social uh, justice bench uh, of the Supreme Court? Yeah. Um, sh shall we answer them first? And no, then no, have no, a okay. final round of, yeah, of questions? Shall we do mm -hmm. that? Okay. You want to ask them now? I, I, no, you can, no, you can answer them now, and then we have a final round of maybe another yeah. two or three questions. Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, you know, uh, the right to water uh, has so far not been recognized as a human right. But uh, very recently, uh, maybe about um, three weeks ago or a month ago, the government of India has uh, announced that they're going to take very strict measures for uh, you know, water conservation. And uh, it's, it's, it's a scheme, you know. So once that scheme is announced and the details are made available, if it comes to the court, it will, I'm pretty sure, it will be taken up as a human right. But today, uh, in the absence of, uh, you know, an exact formulation of the scheme, uh, it is not yet considered a human right. But things like right to health and so on is certainly included. Um, with regard to, uh, you know, some of these development questions uh, which you had raised, uh, you know, the, <coughs> the, the uh, court, I, I, the way I look at it, is, is only a vehicle for this transformation. The transformation is already postulated in the Constitution of India. It is already postulated in the laws that have been framed by Parliament. The question is really, are you implementing them in letter and spirit? If you're not implementing them in letter and spirit, which you should be doing, and a citizen comes to the court and says that, listen, my human right is being violated. Can I turn around and say, well, too bad, you know. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's for parliament to look into it. It's for uh, the uh, executive to look into it. I, I, what, what do I have to do? I have to declare what the law is. And the law says that a body has to be constituted. If it's not constituted, it's not constituted. None of my business. So <clears throat> in, it, in a situation like this, you know, Bhagalpur blindings, for example, where this person wants to come to, uh, wants to prosecute somebody and he's told that, so no, you can't do it. Now, in a situation like that, what is the court supposed to do? You know, if somebody comes to the court and says, bonded labor is there, children are being exploited, child marriages are taking place, people are being killed on the ground that they're insurgents, can the court say that, listen, none of our business, I, I, don't, I don't think we can do that. Because we have an obligation under the Constitution to protect the fundamental rights of citizens. So, the judiciary is one component of this entire transformation. Civil society has to act. And civil society is acting by bringing some of these issues to the courts. Right? They are the ones who are coming to the court and saying that, listen, this is what is wrong. Please do something about it. It could be NGOs, it could be individuals, it could be lawyers, you know, people from a privileged class and a general social awareness. I think that entire combination, once that is taken care of, you know, things are, are bound to change. But today, the, the uh, well, by today I mean a couple of days ago, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the feeling was that, you know, we as society, what can we do? But I think that realization has dawned on the people that we as society can do something and we must do something. And that's why the environmental litigation has, you know, proceeded with leaps and bounds, that the environment is affecting all of us. So if we keep quiet, you know, things are not, the environment is not going to improve. So I, th I think that groundswell is, you know, coming. And uh, <clears throat> with regard to, uh, sorry, uh, what was your question? About land, yeah, yeah, yeah. About land, uh, <clears throat> yes. There, uh, we did get this case of uh, the displacement of 
the people from as a result of the um, construction of the dam on uh, Narmada. There was large scale uh, displacement. Um, three states were involved. The state of Maharashtra was involved, the state of Gujarat, uh, to a very small extent, the state of uh, Rajasthan, and uh, to a very large extent, the state of Madhya Pradesh. Uh, Rajasthan problem has been taken care of. There are very few people that were involved. Uh, Maharashtra said that, uh, you know, we have been able to provide land to everybody. Gujarat said that we have been able to provide land to everybody. Uh, Madhya Pradesh was a big problem. And uh, it, it's, it's actually a very, very complicated issue, you know, uh, which I think straddles several things. One is the availability of land. The second is the identification of the person who has been displaced. Now, this has been going on for several years, you know. So, I was displaced, but now I've got a family, I've got children, I've got grandchildren. So, my requirement of land was a particular amount, but now that my family has expanded, my requirement of land is much more. Can you give me that much? The government said no. So, where do you draw the line? That is one. I think a very major problem which has not been addressed, uh, in my view, is that most of these people are villagers or, or tribal people. So you are dislocating a person from a particular location where he has, you know, it's been there for generations, and you're taking them and putting them somewhere else. Can they adjust in that area? I think that is something which has not been addressed. But, uh, you know, we, we tried uh, to get this done, but um, uh, the lady who is uh, agitating on their behalf, Medha Patkar, uh, she felt that perhaps, uh, you know, being there on the ground would be far more beneficial than coming to the court. So that was not pursued in that matter. But there, there are a lot of challenges in land acquisition, particularly with regard to tribal people. Yeah, I think since we started a little late, we have time for a, a very short last round of questions. And I'm seeing uh, one over there in, in the corner and, and a, second, a second one in that. Uh, yeah. Klaus Beiter, uh, Northwest University, South Africa. Of course, uh, in South Africa, we've got a constitution which is also quite uh, progressive and a court which has been relatively progressive, receding a bit. Um, but what I see now, like uh, 25 years after we got the Constitution, we have increasingly this debate about whether the Constitution is satisfactory because a large population gets uh, increasingly impatient with rights not, not being delivered. And so there's a question, there, there's the whole debate of decolonizing and also the argument that the Constitution perhaps itself, especially with its protection of property, is actually a, still a colonial product, no matter how progressive or social it actually is. So we get that debate not only with political parties, but you also get it among scholars, uh, you know, saying that the Constitution is perhaps not, not the solution. I'd, I wouldn't know what the solution is, but do, do, did you ever have a similar debate in India? So that the question concerns the acceptance of the Constitution and the role of the, Constitu of the Supreme Court. Uh, Sadat D'Souza, Humboldt University. Justice Lokur, uh, my question was with respect to how the social justice bench came to be and how you had this conversation with the Chief Justice. And, and since, at least in the last five years, it seems that as Chief Justices change, there, there are social justice benches or there are not. And, and my question is, how can you sort of have an institutional coherence uh, when you're dealing with matters of social justice? And does the Supreme Court have an obligation to its litigants to actually have some sort of institutional uh, consistency with, when it, and, and something that does not depend on the ideologies of the judges as, as time changes? Uh, yeah, I, I, we can't take everyone, I'm, uh, I'm afraid. Um, we'll have one question by the lady here in the middle. Thank you. 
Uh, my name is Leila Latif. I'm from the Center of Law and Global Justice from Cardiff. I'm particularly interested in the concept of continuing mandamus. And I was wondering, like, for example, the, state, the Supreme Court of Israel, when it's passing directions for government, it normally frames that based on the fiscal policy of the state. Because, well, if we want public hospitals, if we want access to essential medicines, there has to be a financial framework for that. And because of budget deficits, most governments are not able to, you know, implement progressive realization of the right to health. So does the continuous mandamus within the Indian jurisprudence also look to subject fiscal responsibility for the government in implementing that? And finally, um, this interplay between social justice and cultural relativism. I mean, we can have social justice from a state-centered perspective, where the state tells the society what is good for them, but it also has to be acceptable to society, the law that binds them. So where the society refuses to accept a particular norm by the state, how does the judiciary resolve that conflict? Thank you. Yeah, I'm afraid we have to close it here, and all the other questions need to be posed during, during the lunch break. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, so far as your question is concerned, um, I, I, I don't think anybody uh, in our Supreme Court, uh, including myself, have felt that the Constitution has not worked. You know, it has worked, it has taken time, and uh, I think this is one of the challenges that uh, we are facing on how to deliver justice quickly. You know, like this uh, case of Sampurna Behura that I had mentioned. Um, <clears throat> it was, she had this journalist had filed it in 2006, and it came up in my court in 2015. That's after about nine years. So most of the children that she was talking about had already become adults, you know, by that time. So, uh, yeah, the, 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 the idea is to make the constitution work, you know, with the greatest possible speed. And uh, I think the social justice bench uh, has been able to do that to a very large extent. It's not that, you know, the whole case is decided at one point of time. You know, that, that's part of the continuing mandamus thing. You cannot decide 20 issues at one go. So perhaps you decide one or two issues, make sure they're implemented. Go on to some two or three other issues, make sure they're implemented. Go on to the next couple of issues, make sure they're implemented. And then at the end of it all, you know, see if there's anything remaining. So that by itself takes a little bit of time, you know, but I think the social justice bench has been able to speed up the process. So something which had normally taken maybe about 10 years or 12 years, perhaps got sorted out within a couple of years, one year or two years, through this process of continuous mandamus. There are other challenges like prison reforms, you know, it's, it's so huge that uh, we felt that we, we, we can't handle it, you know, so we had to appoint a committee to look into it and give us expert advice. Now, I spoke to the judge who had been appointed as uh, the chairperson of the committee and uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and he told me that, yeah, he's working on it, you know, but he's been able to prepare only an interim report, you know, almost a year has gone by. So some of these challenges are really huge, you know. So delays is an issue, but I don't think uh, you could attribute that to the Constitution not functioning as it should, yeah. Uh, consistency uh, <laughs> with the Chief Justice. Uh, well, <clears throat> last year in uh, January, some of us had uh, uh, held what was called a press conference. It wasn't a press conference. Um, but we had uh, voiced our uh, unhappiness at the way the uh, uh, Chief Justice was functioning. Uh, so really something has to come out of it. You know, uh, the Chief Justice has to be consistent. Uh, we have frequent changes. Uh, you know, every year there's a new Chief Justice. So really that, that, that's a challenge which I think the Supreme Court will have to somehow or the other handle administratively, right? Uh, fiscal policies, we don't touch them. You know, that's entirely for the government to decide. But, you know, like the unemployment thing or the housing thing, you know, 
the government comes out with a plan. So if they have a plan, they have made provision for the money for that plan, for implementing that plan. And then if you turn around and say that, listen, I don't have the money. How did you have that plan then? Why did you have it? If you didn't have the money, why did you make that plan? So obviously you have that money, you know, but you want to use it for something else, which you can't do. Because then what you're doing is you're depriving persons whom you want to benefit. You're depriving them of the money that is due to them. Should you be doing that? And this is where the dialogue with the uh, officers of the government helped. Where the officers of the government said that, yeah, you know, we are uh, diverting the money for something else or we are not getting it in time. Uh, national disaster management, for example. There has to be a provision for a disaster. So if a disaster takes place, you can't say, well, I'm sorry, I don't have the money, you know. <laughs> so you have to have that plan. But we don't interfere in the fiscal policy. We just say that if you have the money, please utilize it for the purpose for which you have kept it aside. That, that's the limited uh, you know, scope of uh, interference. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. This was yeah, wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.